Well, we had to stop our jazzy music. It's five after the hour. Thank you, Deirdre, who's serving as our, our resident DJ this afternoon, this evening. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome all of you to our fourth conversation in the ninth annual Turo University of California, Turo University, California Social Justice and Public Health Speaker Series, hosted by the Public Health Program. My name is Gail Cummings, and I am the director of the Public Health Program, joined by Dr. Deirdre Wilson, who serves as the chair of the Community Action for Health Concentration in the Master of Public Health Program here at TUC. And together we coordinate and host the Social Justice and Public Health Speaker Series. We are so glad to see so many of you from all across California and as far as New York. Um, so thank you so much for putting your hometown and maybe where you are currently residing in the chat. And I'd love to see uh, where everyone is from before the end of today's session. Before we begin today's webinar, as we do um, regularly, we want to make sure that we pause and, and reflect that regardless of where we, reside, we, where we are residing, we are sitting on ancestral and unceded territory. Here in Vallejo, California, uh, where the home of Turo University, we sit <clears throat> on, confederated, on the confederated villages of the Lijan, the Carquin, and the Patwin peoples who are the traditional stewards of this, this land. We also pause to remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought here from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of our, survi of our survivors. And we acknowledge that all immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples have contributed to building this country and continue to be an integral part of our labor force. And as we do this work, it remains our collective responsibility to critically understand these histories, to repair harm that has impacted generations and to honor, protect and sustain this land. If this is your first time joining us, the purpose of this seminar series is to provide upstream discussions around social justice and public health for students in our MPH programs and professionals in public health, medicine, education, pharmacy, and nursing degree programs, as well as for our community and global partners. Each year we focus on a different topic, and this year's topic is impacts of technology on health equity and social justice. So over the six series, six sessions in our series, we will continue to hear from leading experts across diverse fields of health policy, public health, techno science, history, and social justice, who will help us understand the current technology landscape with discussions centered around how it is developed, deployed, and regulated, which can both promote as well as under undermine social justice and health equity. We have been Extremely fortunate to continue bringing remarkable speakers to our series over the last eight years. We started off this year's series with Dr. Ruha Benjamin, who provided a groundbreaking analysis on race and technology, followed by Molly Turner, who talked about the intersections of technology on urban life and the built environment. And this was followed by our last speaker, Maya Wiley, who led a talk about the digital divide as a social determinant. All of these conversations have uh, been firmly rooted and centered in uh, health equity and social justice. And today is no different. We are super excited uh, about our panel. Today we have two amazing speakers, Dr. Tarika McCall, who will talk about leveraging technology to advance health equity and ethical, considera and ethical considerations based on uh, her research and our user design mobile application. Her talk will be followed by Dr. Sergi Sergio Litwa, who will provide an overview on artificial intelligence in the healthcare system. But before we get to our panel, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Deirdre, Deirdre Wilson, who will cover some housekeeping details and will introduce our first speaker. Thank you all for participating this evening uh, and welcome once again. The roadmap for this evening will have presentations from Drs. Tarika McCall and Dr. Sergio uh, Litwa, uh, and then we'll have a discussion and Q&A at the end. We ask that 
If you are interested in asking questions of our panelists, that you please put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will make sure that our speakers are able to see them. We have two uh, continuing education opportunities this evening. The first is our continuing medication, uh, uh, medical uh, CME units. Uh, if you're interested in participating, you can use the activity code on the screen, 67CUSP, uh, and this code will be available in the chat function. Our second opportunity is for our uh, social justice badges. Uh, if you would like to take place, uh, I mean, take part in uh, this self-paced course, please go to the link, which will also be in the chat function. And last uh, is our Socially Just podcast, where we highlight uh, speakers from our past social justice speaker series, and we'll also highlight our speakers from this year's uh, social justice podcast, I mean, I'm sorry, social justice speaker series this year. I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Tarika McCall. Dr. McCall is an assistant professor in the Biostatistics Department, Health Informatics Division at the Yale School of Public Health and secondary faculty at the Yale School of Medicine, Biomedical Informatics and Data Science section and the director of the Consumer Health Informatics Lab at Yale. Dr. McCall's research interests focus on reducing health disparities in mental health service access and use through technology. Specifically, she examines the use of telehealth modalities to deliver mental health services and resources to communities that are underserved. Dr. McCall's expertise is in user-centered design and usability testing of digital health tools. She has experience leading multidisciplinary teams and is also um, uh, a, lead, a leader in academia in the development of digital health tools and currently teaches a course on the topic, user-centered design and digital health tools at Yale School of Public Health. As the director of the Consumer Health Informatics Lab, CHILL, Dr. McCall provides guidance to faculty and students in the development of digital health tools, such as clinical decision support tools, mobile apps, and wearables for diverse populations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tarika McCall. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Wilson. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. So good evening, everyone. Um, today I'll talk about the importance of using inclusive design when creating digital health tools. And the title of this talk was actually a comment that was made in response to showing some design mockups for an app that's created to support individuals with the history of incarceration as they transition back to their communities. We were told they are, um, they're so used to no one listening to them. And so they were very surprised to see their recommendations to address their needs in the app design. So I'll talk about the potential for a digital technology to reduce health inequities and present two examples of using a user-centered design approach to, to create more inclusive digital health tools. I'll end by discussing ethical considerations when designing digital health tools, especially for communities that are underserved. So I'll start by stating that we should always have at the forefront of our minds how the digital health tool we are creating will be used to reduce health inequities. Digital health tools such as mobile apps and wearables can be used to increase access to health services and resources due to the ability to scale to local communities and globally. Also, there might be some higher upfront development costs. Um, however, the access to a digital health tool can be offered to users at no or low cost, which increases access. Also, there's the ability to personalize it. For example, your settings in a mental health app 
you know, being able to personalize it could increase its usefulness, um, increase engagement, and also increase the effectiveness of the intervention. Digital health tools can also be used to facilitate patient provider communication and shared decision making. And it can have some interoperability with EHR to better tailor treatment plans. With the use of things like digital phenotyping, such as collecting raw sensing and phone use data and collection of patient reported outcomes. So I wanted to pose this question, what happens when communities that are underserved are not included in the design process? So for one, you may have created more options, but the disparity still exists. Or worse, um, we have now created intervention generated inequalities where individuals who already had greater access to mental health resources and services um, than those from marginalized communities now have these additional resources while those who would actually benefit the most are left behind. There is also the issue of creating tools that are not culturally relevant. Specifically, if I can't relate to the content, um, then I'll find it less useful because it doesn't address uh, my needs and preferences. And then there's the issue of mistrust. If I don't feel like my community was considered much less a part of creating this technology, I may be less likely to trust the company or the investigator that made it. So why is user-centered design important? One, you don't wanna spend a lot of time and effort and money creating a wonderfully ineffective digital health tool. For those who are not familiar with the process, a user-centered design or UCD is a very iterative process and the users and their needs are the focus um, in each step of the process. This includes understanding the context of use, specifying the user requirements, creating design solutions and evaluating the digital health tool. So the goal is to create products that are actually useful and highly usable. So now I'll actually speak about my study to develop a mobile app to support self-management of anxiety and depression among Black American women. So I'm gonna start with a little background. Um, in 2020, it was estimated that one in four Black women in the US experienced mental illness in that past year. And data from the 2020 National Survey on Drug Use and Health showed that 32% of non-Hispanic Black women who reported experiencing mental illness in the past year did not receive mental health treatment during that time. Historically, barriers such as stigma of mental illness, structural gendered racism, less access to treatment, lack of or inadequate health insurance, less access to a provider who shares their socio-cultural background, mistrust of providers, and limited health literacy have all prevented marginalized populations from seeking care. I particularly focus on anxiety and depression, um, and I do so because anxiety and mood disorders, such as major depressive disorder, are the most common mental health conditions among Black women, with approximately 16% experiencing generalized anxiety in their lifetime, and about 27% experiencing depression in their lifetime. So disparities in mental health service use is concerning because poor management of anxiety and depression symptoms contributes to lower quality of life, loss of productivity, and poor medication adherence, which can uh, lead to worse health outcomes, especially for those who have chronic health conditions. Um, as you might know, there's been numerous studies that found that mobile health interventions actually increase access to mental health services and resources and they are effective in helping uh, participants in the studies um, reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression. However, the majority of the published studies were conducted with primarily um, white participants, which may affect the generalizability of the results to other racial and ethnic groups. However, pr previous studies have shown that Black women are comfortable with participating in mHealth research and interventions, and about 80% own smartphones. Therefore, I think this is a great potential to actually remedy some of the disparities in mental health service use by leveraging use of smartphones for information dissemination and delivery of mental health services and culturally relevant resources. So now I'll discuss the focus groups which were um, conducted in part to answer the research question, what content and features should be included in a smartphone app 
that's tailored to support management of anxiety and depression among Black American women. So the focus group sessions were actually held at a Durham County Library in North Carolina and at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in January 2020. So right before the start of the, uh, when the pandemic was uh, declared. We recruited women who were 18 years or older, who identified as Black or African-American or multiracial Black and another race. Um, and they were recruited primarily via a web-based survey that was launched prior to the focus groups, as well as postings on social media sites and flyers posted in public locations in the Durham and Chapel Hill areas. So the topics of the focus group discussion included uh, past and current causes of anxiety and depression and the coping skills that they've used. Also, we asked about their attitudes and perceptions towards mental illness and their past uh, use of mental health treatment or past um, how they received mental health treatment in the past. We also asked about uh, what content and features were needed in a smartphone app designed to help Black American women manage anxiety and depression. And then lastly, we wanted to know about those barriers of facilitators to use of a smartphone app for mental health care. So the sessions were actually audio recorded and we transcribed them verbatim. And then we actually use Envivo software to conduct thematic analysis. And the focus group transcripts were analyzed basically to reveal the themes related to the preferences and concerns with using a mental health app. The reoccurring themes across the focus groups were also noted. So now I'll just dive into the results by first discussing the characteristics of the focus group participants. We had 20 women that attended one of the four focus group sessions and each group had about five uh, participants. Once again, all participants identified as a black, black or African-American or multiracial. And the study participants range in age from 21 to 79 years old with about a mean age of 36.6. Um, we did have a multi-generational um, uh, focus groups. However, about 75% of the participants were less than 50 years old. So the focus group participants shared that in the past, they primarily used mental health and wellness apps that had features for meditation, mood tracking, calorie intake, and activity monitoring. Um, in addition, they mentioned the use of music apps and listening to podcasts. Inspirational messages on, on social media apps were also mentioned as being beneficial to their mental wellness. And so all of this was very informative for us to know what they've tried in the past to improve their mental wellness. So what you see here are just, it's just a snapshot of the design recommendations that came out of the focus group, right? And so the recommendations from the focus group participants focus on the type of content and features that should be included in the app, as well as suggestions to increase app usage and establish trust with users. So I'll just take a few minutes to discuss them in more detail and then share a few quotes from participants. So many suggestions were actually given on the content that should be included in an app design to help Black American women manage anxiety and depression. And the recommendations were either informational or inspirational. So for example, participants stated they would be, um, so they, they stated they would like information about how to find a black woman therapist in their area, and then guidance on how to deal with common stressors, such as microaggressions and imposter syndrome. They also wanted information about events in the area to connect with other black women. Inspirational messages and also encouraging stories about how others overcame adversity were also desired. And the participants also recommended having positive and supportive messages in the app and suggested readings that promote mental wellness. So regarding information to find a therapist, a participant voice, she would like to be able to find black women therapists in the area with also a listing of what insurance they take, their hours, all that good stuff. Because again, those barriers, people are just like, where are these people, right? So there was a lot of discussion in the focus group about difficulty finding a black woman therapist. And then when they thought they found someone, the person didn't accept their insurance or they didn't have availability, right? So they wanted us to somehow facilitate in the app, um, narrowing down a therapist that might be available and accept their insurance to make it easier for them to seek care. 
Regarding some of the features that they um, wanted in the app, they said they wanted features to allow them to monitor their progress and practice coping techniques and to connect with others. So for example, participants suggested that the app have features to track anxiety, depression, and mood. In addition, they recommended guided meditation, deep breathing, and other coping techniques, but specifically narrated by a Black woman. So participants stated that most meditation apps use a British or Australian voice to narrate. However, they desired to hear what they described as the Black auntie voice. So <laughs> they mentioned um, Tabitha Brown. So in other words, they wanted the caring voice of a middle-aged Black American woman. And so th that was one thing that they said throughout the app, they would like any kind of narration to have the Black auntie voice. Lastly, they uh, recommended having group chat rooms to connect with other users and the ability to connect with therapists through the app via messaging or video call. So they kind of wanted this three-tiered uh, um, approach to, to taking care of their mental health. They wanted to be able to self-manage. And then if they needed additional support, they wanted to be able to connect with peers. And then beyond that, if they felt they needed extra support, then they wanted to be able to easily connect with a therapist. So for example, um, as I talk about the features, one uh, participant voice that she would like, if you could have a history in there, and then you can look back and see, when was the last time that you had this anxiety? And what helped when you had this anxiety attack or whatever? You don't just end it with what you see. You can write it down, what helped you, and then you can go back to that. So there was a desire to be able to kind of note down, you know, take down what actually helped you and reflect on that so that the next time it happens, you can go back to that, you know, do that practice or whatever, whatever helped you and kind of get past that anxiety attack quicker. So next we talked about, uh, you know, how do we increase engagement and participants voice that they would be more likely to use the app regularly. One, if they found value in it, of course, and it was easy to use, but they emphasize really the importance of community um, when using the app. Um, as I mentioned, they wanted to connect with their peers. They also wanted to connect with a therapist. Um, and they also wanted to learn um, more about managing anxiety and depression through learning coping skills. They also mentioned uh, having some gamification in the app, right, to give the, the user a sense of accomplishment and to make the app more sticky. Um, participants voiced that if that was too cumbersome, if there were too many notifications, or if the exercise took too long, it would discourage the app use. But overall, they were really excited about this idea of having something that was tailored just for them to help them manage their anxiety or depression. For example, regarding providing some type of incentive to use the app, uh, one participant stated, although it would be a superficial incentive, I feel just like apps that keep track or give you stars or anything that I guess signifies that you've completed something in itself can be validating to people especially with good habit building and stuff like that. So one of the suggestions for gamification was like, oh, you know, if I am doing well, it can start off with a flower and then eventually I can have some type of garden at the end to see my progress, right? So that was just something that they desired uh, for um, to have in the app as well. Um, regarding the topic of trust, uh, most participants' concerns were about security and privacy. Right, so there was this concern that the app could be hacked or that their data could be disclosed. Um, also, participants had apprehension about who would own the app and their data sharing policies. Um, there had been many data breaches in the news which concerned participants and they were also aware that many apps sell user data. And the primary concern was that the data would be used to harm them personally or black women in general. So not only were they concerned about their self and um, possibly being exposed, but they wanted to know if, you know, someone who had access to this data could use it to somehow paint Black women in a negative light. For example, regarding data sharing and use, a participant actually voiced her concern, stating, I was watching the news on the treadmill last night, two nights ago, and they were talking about how these big companies on these dating apps are selling data. And so I would be worried about who has control over the, over the data that's happening in the app? And what are they going to do with it now that they have all this information about Black women? 
So I thought it was really awesome to see that it wasn't just about, you know, protection of their individual information, but there really was this care for community. They didn't want Black women to be painted in a negative light. So they they literally pointed at me and were like, do you own this? Are you, are you going to be in charge of making sure that the data is secure? And so I thought that that was really important to stress is that it's not just about you know, the individual, but also about protecting the community. So out of this, uh, out of the focus groups, we actually published this paper on the design recommendations and you can scan the QR code um, to access the paper. So this is the current version of the app that was created based on what we learned from the focus groups. And we did uh, some usability testing as well. So we're now gearing up to um, start co-design workshops to create the culturally responsive mindfulness-based cognitive therapy content for the app. So now I'm just gonna briefly switch gears and discuss a study that I'm collaborating on uh, with Dr. Karen Wong, uh, who's at Yale. And uh, basically the Pearl app is designed to support individuals with the history of incarceration as they're rejoining their communities. So, um, Basically, what we did is we went out and we recruited individuals that were released from uh, Connecticut Department of Corrections and seen at the Yale New Haven Health Transitions Clinic. So we recruited primarily through flyers and word of mouth. And so we recruited 20, um, 20 participants to actually do individual interviews. Um, and basically, the uh, inclusion criteria just, you know, they had to have a history of incarceration, um, we had participants that ranged in age from 21 to 64 years old, and 20% of the participants identified as female. Most of the participants identified as Black and had completed um, a high school, uh, had their high school diploma or a GD. Um, and also looking at um, the participant breakdown, uh, about 60% uh, had been incarcerated for up to two years. So what we did is we had semi-structured interviews um, with uh, these individuals, and we talked to them to understand their, experiencing, their experience rejoining their communities after release from prison or jail. So we explored individual, organizational, and systemic uh, factors that basically served as barriers or facilitators to accessing health and social services and other resources post-release. And then what we wanted to do is find out how technology can be used to support them during this transitionary period. So what I'm showing here is the design process. Um, it was very iter iterative and it included in-depth interviews um, followed by rapid analysis sessions, interpretation sessions with the team and also individuals with a history of incarceration. Then we were able to take those insights for design and actually mock up some high fidelity prototypes get feedback from uh, potential users. And then now it's in the phase of uh, actually um, an app development phase now. So uh, what you see here is just the affinity diagram from the interpretation session we had. And we basically created this to determine the prior priorities for design by organizing the raw data from the interviews to reveal common themes and issues among the potential users. And from there, Right, so we built out the affinity di diagram, and then we were able to generate our priorities. And um, and our priorities list, what we did is we, you know, made sure that we had our must-haves. So to the right of your screen, you'll, screen you'll see a section that has must-haves, and so these are the things that should be included in the initial prototype. And the findings reveal themes and priorities that highlight the need for content and features that allow users to easily access resources for employment, housing healthcare and medical needs. Um, and this includes mental health and substance use. They also wanted to be able to connect with community health workers and they wanted formal and informal um, support. So they wanted support, yes, from um, health professionals, but also they wanted to have peer support within the app as well. They also wanted to know about their rights and to be able to easily navigate their rights um, you know, um, and we basically told them that we would, you know, include information about 
uh, Department of Corrections and their rights and getting, um, some of them had trouble getting their, the, the things they came in with and they wanted to know more about the legal process. So having some information about how to connect with a lawyer or to, to find out the processes for getting things done is uh, included in the app. Also, there was a need for features to facilitate, um, as I mentioned, peer support, but they didn't just want virtual peer support. They mentioned having in-person support groups as well. Um, so they said it would be great for virtual support. Um, however, it'd be, if we have a listing of some in-person groups that we can go to, that would be um, amazing as well. So this is actually the current version of it of the app that was created based on what we learned from the interviews. And we're now actually getting ready for usability testing uh, in preparation for the pilot study. So we have a design paper that will be published in January. However, you can scan the QR code to access the protocol paper. So I just want to kind of uh, wrap up talking about ethical considerations and challenges. And so uh, one thing I wanna stress is that, you know, we know that the use of digital health tools is on the rise, um, especially since COVID. However, we must make sure that privacy and confidentiality concerns are adequately addressed. Um, protecting personally identifiable information and protected health information is of course of utmost importance and there must be transparency on data ownership and use. Also, I wanna stress that a one size fits all approach to designing interventions may lead to more options, but continued disparity in receiving mental health care. Um, to increase the likelihood of adoption, M health interventions should be culturally informed. So incorporating the recommendations from participants um, in these uh, um, that participated in the research study and knowledge of their technology use and behaviors may help to mitigate some future intervention generated inequalities. And I truly, truly believe that designing for the most um, marginalized communities actually improves the digital health tool for all users. We should also consider whether our intended users have things like access to uh, internet enabled devices, broadband internet access, and also their digital and health literacy. Sometimes these things are overlooked um, as we're thinking about what solutions we, we could create. Right, so these are just some of the things that impact whether communities who have the greatest need and therefore would benefit the most are able to use the digital health tool we are creating. Um, I've provided two examples of projects that focus on using inclusive design methods to create better digital health tools for communities that are underserved. And so when we think about social justice as it pertains to healthcare, it's the idea that everyone deserves equal access to culturally appropriate resources and services to improve their health and well being. But this can't actually be accomplished if their needs and preferences are not considered from the outset of creating digital health tools. So, in closing, I just want to say that we should not have this kind of tech first approach to reducing health inequities. Uh, tech could be complementary to a non tech solution or not appropriate to use at all, right? Um, and then the intended users should be included from the very beginning to determine what the actual need is. Um, they would know also <laughs> what, you know, uh, they should be included in the process of determining the best solution and whether uh, tech can be leveraged to meet their needs. So I always find it interesting when there's something created and you, you're, you start talking to them about, um, you know, the developer or the PI about, you know, who was included in the process and there's very little input from the intended user, right? So I would just caution um, against that and encourage um, the use of inclusive design practices. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And here's my contact information. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. McCall. That was, that was fascinating and so timely. Um, and I know as we move through um, our second speaker, uh, there are a few questions already in the chat. We'll, we'll certainly get to them. I have a number of questions myself and comments. So thank you so much for, for that, that talk. Um, we're gonna switch gears now and introduce our next speaker. And again, I do encourage you for uh, those of you who do have questions to please 
savor your questions. Um, you can put them in the Q&A function now and Dr. Wilson and I will help uh, ensure that we get um, your questions uh, asked to the, to the panel um, following Dr. Liqua's uh, talk. So now I'm going to introduce Dr. Sergio Litqua, who completed his medical degree at the University of Buenos Aires and his master's in public health at the University of El Salvador, also in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He is a faculty member uh, in the University of Miami, Miami Department of Surgery and the Director of Global Bioethics at the University of Miami Institute for Bioethics, a World Health Organization on Ethics and Health Policies. As a bioethics director, Dr. Dr. Litwa's uh, work focuses on the development of research and education activities with international governmental organizations, universities, and the private sector, mostly from Latin America, on human subject protection, research ethics, and uh, the responsibility of conduct in research, responsible conduct in research. From 2005 to 2018, he was the International Director for the Collaborative Institutional Training Initiative, a web-based initiative for research ethics and responsible conduct of research education. During 2011, he served as a member of the International Research Panel at the, Uni at the U.S. Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethics. Please help me welcome Dr. Sergio Litqua, and he will pronounce his name correctly as I log off. Welcome. Thank you very much, Gail, for, for this introduction. And thank you very much for showing uh, my photo when I had some re hair remains and my hair was still have some brownish color. So so now I it, it's a reminder of when I was younger. So my, my last name, it as I said, it depends who pronounces it, but it could be Litevka, it's a, a Polish last name, but it's a free express. Everybody can ex pronounce that in the way that feels that it feels comfortable, not, not a problem for that. So let me share my screen and let me go to my presentation. Um, basically, what I'm going to address today and and uh, the presentation that Tarika did before it's it's a good introduction for what I am trying to to present here it's uh the model the the way that artificial intelligence is changing the shape of our healthcare system in the United States and most of developed countries so we are still to this, this is an ongoing process, and we are a little bit dazzled in, in, in the way that these models are changing everything. And we don't know how much is hype, how much could be real, and overall, whether those systems will help to uh, bridge gaps in, in, in the social justice or maybe will contribute to deepen inequalities. So what I would like to do is just to introduce some of the concepts related to what is artificial intelligence in principle. Uh, I know that everybody's talking about artificial intelligence and there is a lot of definitions. I took one from the World Health Organization, which is refers to the ability of algorithms and coding technology to learn from data. So they can perform automated tasks without every step in the process and having to be programmed explicitly by a human. Human. This is not what we know, for example, somehow it could be Alexa, could be Siri, but there are big difference between Alexa, Siri, and all those uh, apps that we normally use and what is real artificial intelligence. Um, another definition, this is from the United States Government Accountability Office, is that the ability of, to, of machines to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, recognizing patterns, learning from experience, drawing conclusions, making predictions. And this is where it falls into the realm of healthcare systems, making predictions. We will talk about that in a moment. But meanwhile, a little bit of history. Uh, the term artificial intelligence was coined 
by uh, John McCarthy in, mil- in 1955 at the Dartmouth Summer Research Project of Artificial Intelligence. Before that, uh, there, there, is, there were a lot of attempts to, to, to work on that. Maybe if you saw the movie, The Imitation Game, in which it, it portrays the life of, um, of the person, the, the Alan Turing, who developed with another collaborators, the Project Enigma, which was a way to break the code that Germans were using in World War II. And, and what Turing envisioned was just the creation of a model that could respond in a way that in the other side of the model, nobody would know whether that was a human or a machine. And that it's known as the Turing test. But what uh, Turing didn't have was the technology that we have these days. But the concept was, it, 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 it goes back in half a century or even more. Um, 1964, Joseph Weizenbaum at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology developed a very interesting model. The name was ELISA. And ELISA was meant to parody open-ended psychotherapy. You know, you go to the, if any of you have any experience, experience in, in having dialogues with a psychotherapist, and in many ways, the questions are, what do you think? Why are you saying that? Uh, how do you feel? And that was the way that ELISA worked. It just created open-ended uh, questions in which people get got in, engaged in, in, in responding to that. And what is interesting about ELISA that even everybody knew that that was a machine, not a person. Uh, Based on both collaborators in some opportunity, asking to be let alone with the machine just to keep talking with that thing. And that was in 1964. But again, it was far, far cry for what we know today about artificial intelligence. So the concepts that we have in artificial intelligence that you're going to hear everywhere when, when you are, uh, in, if you're interested in this topic, it's the concept of machine learning. Machine learning, it's a specialized artificial intelligence technique that enables software to improve the performance over time. The system is learning over the same system. And, and it learns, there's a way to learn, which is a supervised learning when a human it's checking and correcting the mistakes that the system does. And unsupervised learning in which it works with unlabeled data seeking to identify underlying structures or patterns. And deep learning, which is the network of what it's known as artificial neural networks. And why neural networks? Because it mimics the way that the neurons are being assembled in our brain to model complex data. So I mentioned before Alexa, Siri, and the difference is that if you compare with that, Alexa and Siri, a little bit, I'm talking about intelligence, so I don't want to use a derogative term, but a little bit silly just to be soft in that, because they have some pre-prepared uh, answers to what we ask to them. And they do that well as an assistant. But the, inter- the interesting thing about artificial intelligence and those models, and I'm going to talk particularly on the transformer model, is that it creates new answers. It creates answers coming from the model that they learned for what they were trained. But after they were trained, they create, if you allow me the expression, their own conclusions on the data that they have. Um, Two big aspects in artificial intelligence are related to interpretability and explainability. And this is one of the key topics when we are talking about artificial intelligence in the healthcare system, because it's related to the uncertainty. Uh, Interpretability refers to the ability to understand the inner work of an AI model. So 
if the model is more or less transparent, you can understand how it makes inferences between the input that the data that was loaded and the output, what the system is saying. So an interpretable algorithm could be explained and understandably by a human being. You can say from A, it got to B. And then it goes to explainability, which pertains to the ability to explain how the system got to that decision-making process. So an explainable model provides a clear and intuitive explanation of how the decisions are being made. And we can understand why the model reached that particular result. Explainability is focusing on why an algorithm made a specific decision and why or how that decision can be justified. Now, the problem here is that it falls on what it's called the black box. And the black box, it's no more, no less, that that part in which we don't understand how the system got the conclusion. And this is what creates all the tension about those models, because as we are going to see in a moment, the way that they process the data and how from that data get to a conclusion falls in that black box. And that black box, it's not understandable in many ways, not even for us who are uh, lay people in that regard, but even for the programmers. So those who create the code cannot explain to you in many ways why the system got that conclusion. Um, this is interesting. This is for Alex London, who wrote a lot about artificial intelligence and, and what is related to medical decisions and, and, and uh, the concept of the black box. And, and systems are agnostic in the sense that they designers do not program a model that reflects their understanding of the casual instructor of the program to be solved. In other words, system, they don't have any moral or any good and wrong uh, uh, background. They, those systems create simply an answer that it's based on the data that they have. And from that got to a conclusion. And so the programs, the programmers learn, so they know that the, the model is learning from all the data that has been fed on it. But in fact, it's impossible to know, and the system is not taking any, any side, except that in many ways, it's reflecting the data, and some data, it's based, it's, it's supported also for a lot of bias. So this is one of the risks of the artificial intelligence model in which, uh, as we are going, it's, 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 it's about the data, how the data, how trustworthy is the data that already create the system. And now we are going to, which is to, for many, a revolution. It creates a revolution, not only in the healthcare system, but in the whole world. In, and, and some make some comparison about uh, in how in the 15th century, uh, Johann Gutenberg, uh, after what happened with, after he created the printing press and the knowledge that was very limited those days began to expand because of the possibility of printing information, printing books, printing pamphlets. And so the knowledge was become something much more democratic and, and, and collective. Uh, those models are named as, you know, GPT, which is one of the models. Those GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformers. And those models are based on what it's called large language models. It has an unsupervised supervised pre-training in which the models, what they do, they, I, I'm trying to find the right word, they are crawling in the web. So uh, since 2017, 
when Google was the first in create that kind of uh, transformer model architecture, they got ingested all what they could find in the web, everything. Everything that was in the cloud, everything that was in the web was ingested by those models. And once those models get got all the information and still are still getting that information, unlike the traditional translators, if if by if in any time you use translators that didn't understand, for example, the Google translator before those models in which could wasn't able to understand the context in which the words were they, they could translate the the, the the sentence, but with a lack of understanding in which context that sentence was was created. We had a, when I was in city in the city program at CITI. We had a lot of problems because we were working for Latin America. We translated a lot of uh, text in Spanish, but the systems of those days, I'm talking no more than 15 years ago, 13 years ago, couldn't get the, the, the understanding about, we were talking about research ethics or research integrity. So it was a verbatim translation of the words, but aside of all context. Now those models predict the next word based on the previous word in the sentence. And so with all that kind of data that it's unlabeled, they form uh, a structure of language that as Alan Turing was dreaming in his days, mimic human language. And it has a supervised fine tuning mechanism in which humans are, uh, are looking about how the system responded, but after that, after it rewards or punish, in a way, it's not that they are punished by being lashed or or being sent to bed without having dinner, but but they are tokens, they are system in which the system understands that did it did a good work or that work that word that it found didn't work. And so those models in the supervised fine tuning uh, are trained with label data, which is data that already has been prepared. And, and, and that can predict the output tokens. Tokens is the way that are named the production. When the tokens are those algorithms that are part of the output of, of, the, of the model. And, and those words or tokens are based on the input what the system receives. So each token is a basic unit or the text of a computing code. And this stage allows models to specialize in a specific task of domains, sentiment analysis, question answering, or code generation, or anything. And then you have another model, which is more five tuning, which is the self-attention mechanism in which the system comprehend, quote unquote, relationship between output input and output sequences. Now, the interesting thing about those models is that, for example, GPT and many others had not been trained specifically in medical issues yet because it absorbed everything and it was able to create relationships. Um, they can, for example, in the United States, if you want to practice medicine, you have to approve the, what it's called the three steps of the US medical license examination. And surprisingly, GPT, this uh, GPT, I don't know if the version three or four, but I think it was three, was able to pass the exam with a very good average, with a very good score. But the programmers never train those models just to respond the 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 US MLE. So this is the big difference of the transformers with previous models of artificial intelligence. It it's totally open. And to make things more complex, now we are talking about it's known are known as multimodal artificial intelligence, which is not only words, but various 
type, data, data types of model that amplify accuracy in decision making and, 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 and prediction. And it have to do with images, videos, speech, sound, text. So it's not only that those systems are being fed of what is written, but what it's already uh, pictures, uh, movies, videos, everything. And they create a holistic and nuanced understanding of the specific scenario. In that regards, it mirrors human perception because Again, I don't know your experience in, in talking with those models, but it mimics and you can be engaged in a conversation. Again, I said my quote unquote, I don't want just to go in, in, into the concept of, we are really talking with somebody who understands it's a machine, but they are able to mimic human perception in a very fine way. So those multimodal, artificial intelligence models can enhance diagnostic eventually because it can, it, they are able to integrate patient records, radiology, images, audio, audio, audio interviews, and eventually predict patient trajectories. It's time is enable timely intervention and personalized treatment plans. This is the hype we are going to see whether that hype could be justified by, by reality in many ways, and which are the concerns that we may have. Being concerned about that doesn't mean that we are being negative about those things. This is progress, and we are not rejecting, we are not denying progress. The question is, how much enthusiasm it's maybe blocking the possibility of seeing risk that are related to those models. And this is the reason I probably, you know, uh, the United States president along with uh, other, I mean, the, the government, not the president particularly, I think it's Kamala Harris. There is a summit these days in the UK in which authorities and, and developers are going to discuss, which are which have to be the, re the, the regulatory framework for those models. Uh, we will make another comment later. Um, this is from 2022, less than a year from now, sorry, 2023. And you see, um, everybody talks about ChatGPT, but in fact, ChatGPT is one of many of those transformers that already booming right now. They are everywhere. You have perplexity, you have uh, DAL E, you have Palm M, you name it, lots of names that are investment in creating new codes in those transformers. And those transformers in many ways are being used not only in, in search, uh, in, um, in, in like Google or, or, or Bing, but in medicine and in, in science in general, among other things, economics or, or even art. So some of the challenges, some of few challenges. One, it's data quality. Remember, we were talking about those systems are fed on lots of data coming from everywhere. So those vast data sets, sometimes the quality, it's it's the quality of the training data, it data data is what influence the model's performance. And there is a, a war to define that, which is GIGO. Garbage in, garbage out. That's GIGO. If you fed the system, the models with garbage, it will produce garbage. So, so big questions, in any case, if the system is has not been, has, hasn't been supervised in the right way, can create a lot of bias in the responses because internet, human, mankind, I mean, mankind in general, humans are full, have plenty of bias in many, many ways. And those bias are being transmitted in what you read in the, in the web or in, in, in daily conversations even. So the system will reproduce those particular uh, 
bias and multiply that because of the the way that those systems are very convincing in making you think that they really know what they are talking about. Uh, another another issue is which is the data purpose. Those transformers have to be fine-tuned in many, many ways. But if you don't know exactly for what are they using, the system could eventually go far beyond ethical standards, let alone the concept of hallucinate. We, name, we say that the system is hallucinating when it creates things that doesn't exist, which those models are very good at. Uh, those are called hallucinations. And there was a very interesting paper in 2021. They, the right, the, the scholars who wrote those papers, they uh, defined those models as what they said they are stochastic parrots. Stochastic parrots because those models produce out, produce outputs by mimicking learner partners patterns. Sorry, without genuine understanding. So it replicates human-like speech without truly comprehending the content. Now, let's be fair. Many human beings have the same problem. They are stochastic parrots as well. But in that case, we are talking about models, transformer models, and not human beings. But we have to consider that it's not only a problem of those models. So the models can be precise in the response, but not how always be accurate or contextually appropriate. An example, you can, the way that you communicate with those models is using what it's, uh, it's known as prompts. Prompts are the text that you write to create a query, a, a question. And this is another art in itself, how to make prompts that the system will respond. Now, because the system has a predictive model, it can respond you in a way, but if you push the system and you reject what the system is saying, uh, it could happen many options. Maybe the system will apologize and say, I'm sorry, I am just a artificial intelligence more than I can answer. But it could also happen that the system want to please you and we'll say exactly the opposite of what it was saying before. So the model can be precise in the responses, but could not be necessarily accurate, let alone be contextually appropriate in the way, because it depends where the data came from, how it was, the data has been, came and, and how the system has been trained. Uh, one example of that happened uh, less than a year ago when Meta Artificial Intelligence, Meta, you know, is Facebook, uh, they developed, and there was a big fanfare, big, big announcement, a language model that was allegedly um, um, aiming to create scientific literature. So the, the creators of those models say, okay, we are going to create something that can write taking the data, scientific papers, and that will look really, that will improve knowledge, the advance of knowledge. And and has a lot of uh, repercussion in the media because that was the first time that w one of them like that was at least known publicly. And the answer was among <laughs> some of the papers it wrote was for example, uh, one was about the benefits of eating crushed glass as well to recommend that for future studies. The majority of studies have found that the inclusion of crushed glass, crushed glass in the diet has a positive effect on peak performance, including improving weight gain and feed efficiency. Other paper was about on the benefits of antisemitism. Uh, so, so they have to be <laughs> decommissioned after three or four days when those papers began to appear. I mean, it, it, it didn't go to any peer review. They were trying to do that, 
And suddenly the system that was fed with all the kind of garbage that I mentioned to you, uh, become with that kind of hallucinations, creating papers that look, uh, um, the, look uh, that could make some sense, but actually were totally senseless in, in, in many, many ways. Now, despite of that, there is a lot of enthusiasm in, in promoting the use of those models in medicine. And some of those models are actually being experimented today. So some have to do with making prognosis of patients in intensive care, survival prediction. This is not particularly what, if any of you know Apache or any other models that were predictive models based on algorithms that were used even before the eruption of, of those transformers. But now they're predictive models, even Apache that's being fed also for that. That create also some kind of issues because remember we spoke about the black box and how the, the programs make determination. So it could be helpful, but also could be very dangerous if the physician or the healthcare team uh, are also basing their decisions in what the models are saying. It's not happening today, don't, don't be scared. But there is a risk of what it's known as automation, in which the human tend to believe the system more than their own um, uh, convictions or, or, or ideas or even theories about that. Image interpretation, it's already being used, and those are very good, apparently, in that, in, in MRI um, and computer and, and CT scans. It's, it's already, this is one of the big uses also, not only for, for X-rays or, or, or these elements, but also for ophthalmologic um, exams, in which apparently they are training, they are very good in doing that. We don't know in the long term, but but there is a lot of experiments or or use actually in the healthcare system. Uh, they are being used in in drug discovery process. Actually, uh, there are some antibiotics created uh, by for only uh, using uh, those transformer models. Uh, another another. Um, pro, pro, uh, product by DeepMind, Deep Mind, which is uh, 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 it's predicting about how proteins are folding from a chain of amino acids into 3D shapes. And so any protein could be already investigated and see how it works and how it could be improved for many, many medical reasons. Uh, a task that a human will take, for a human it will take uh, months or even years those models are proven have proven that they can do that in 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 less than an hour. Genomic sequence analysis, clinical notes processing, interpreting e e EKG, uh, cutaneous lessons, chatbots and virtual health assistants, and clinical decision support. There are many others. This is just a sample. Now the problem again, and talking, thinking in terms of social justice and in terms of equity or inequities, it's whether those models, if you have to talk with a chatbot instead of a physician, let alone how difficult it is in the United States to get a conversation with a physician, whether those models can be maybe a good resource, but in the other hand, could be a way to increase isolation from particular people or, or create some sort of the social delusion in which it seems that patients are talking with somebody who seems to be human, but in fact, it's a chatbot. Um, some of the models that you will hear about that are being used in healthcare, birth, which is used to analyze clinical notes. This is things that are happening right now. I mean, it's not the future. It still, it's too early to know whether it works or not, but they're being tested in healthcare settings. 
used to analyze clinical notes and extract information for tasks like diagnostic classification and coding patient history, uh, medication information, doses, dosage, frequencies. BioGPT, which is developed by Microsoft, which creates, it, it's been trained on biomedical text generation and also can make interpretation of the text of medical uh, jargon, medical uh, uh, terms, and translate that translate that into lay terms from people that uh, can talk with the machine and not with a physician to be explained about their conditions. Again, I don't think that I have to explain you in one hand the possible benefits, but also the risk about creating um, a sector of a population that could be more isolated, that it could be, or more alienated in terms of talking with this overall, because healthcare, uh, any healthcare problem, it's probably uh, the most important of anything that we can have along our life. It's not just a legal issue. It's not just a money issue. It's about your health. It's about your life or your loved one, life or health. So. Thinking about uh, people talking with those uh, chatbots could be a little bit scary in many, many ways. Um, and, and you see here many, many others uh, models, which are, for example, this one uh, useful for making prediction of clinical events. And again, those models are being fed with electronic healthcare records which is your clinical record, which in most cases right now, it's not based on paper, but it's based on the web. Of course, there are privacy issues. It's not, no, anybody has access to your clinical records so far, but one way or the other, the system are being trained on that, things, which create also a lot of concerns. Um, here, there are some models that are already working here. Um, uh, some in, uh, other big players. And you see, I mean, Microsoft, you see um, uh, uh, Google and, and the big, big players in, in, the, in, the, um, in that part of what is related to all those big monsters. In in in, in, uh, in the web, uh, monitoring remote patients with for respiratory conditions. So again, there are many advocates of the use of those models, saying you can access to remote populations, people that are isolated, and eventually provide better healthcare that they already have. Question is whether or not this is really true, we don't know yet. We don't know whether that's improving access to the healthcare system or it's just normalizing barriers to access to access and creating disparities between those who can be the, have the privilege to be seen by physicians and those who will deal with chatbots. More of those models in which they can create conversational AI experience for healthcare. Uh, and you see here many other uses. uses. Uh, we don't have time, but just to have it, we have smart medical robots right now, surgical robots. I mean, not Da Vinci, which is uh, particularly not autonomous. There is no, any of those models still is totally autonomous. I mean, it needs supervision and probably can do better surgeries <clears throat> that, than humans. But humans are on top of that, um, trying to be aware that in one way or the other, have to prevent any deviation for what the, system, what the systems are doing. So it's like, maybe it's not a good comparison, but uh, planes, the use of our, uh, auto, uh, automatic pilots, but you have the crew already been on top on that, just trying to make sure that 
the model, even the planes flying by itself, but there are human beings taking control of that if things go wrong. The same with those models so far. So some ethical challenges, some was mentioned before, but I mean, from all what we spoke, it's, it's obvious that we have problems with data privacy, data property. Privacy, it, it, it's obvious. And property also, it's very important because those models, as I said to you, are being trained by what is already there in the web. And to do it these days, there is a lot of, um, of lawsuits against those companies by people that feel that in one way or the other, either the privacy or the intellectual property has been, have been violated. The other problem that is the over-reliance in automation, which means what I mentioned before, a physician that, or a healthcare team that suddenly have one idea, but the system are telling the, those models are telling otherwise. And that creates in a highly litigious society as is the United States, another problem, which is if things go wrong, who is responsible? Who is accountable? Okay, you could say if the system said something wrong, it would be accountable. The, 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 those who make the programming of the system, the, the, those who create the system, the model, are responsible. But what if the physician or those who are in the, in the, in the medical team decides to do not what the system, what the models are saying, but act in, based on their knowledge or the, in their conscience, and then things go wrong? So you could see that there is a lot of issues that are going to be more and more frequent uh, uh, as long as those models are going to, to, to increase their participation in the healthcare system. Bias and discrimination, of course, because if the model had been trained with, um, with that kind of bias or with particular ethnic or social group, and then the model want to reproduce those particularities in a different group, there could be a lot of bias or even wrong information, or even models trained here in the United States, but being used in developing countries, which maybe the conditions are different. The models are agnostic in the way they don't understand that the environments can be changed. Not those models, probably in the future they will. Uh, accountability. Incorrect predictions, which is called feedback loops, which is the pro the, those models can perpetuate the error if there is no correction. And for being a correction, they have, be, they have to be curated by individuals. And those individuals have to be very specialized, for example, in healthcare, being physicians or nurses. And that could be an intensive work for lots of people that could be so, uh, supervising all those models, could be even like working in a fabric, in a factory, in an assembly line, in which you have to see how those systems are interacting. Uh, and, and that is related to model validation. I mean, you have to validate the model in order to make sure that it's doing the right thing and it's improving constantly. And function creep is another word that you're going to hear very often, which is when the system just already goes out of what they were supposed to do and could be used by governments or by uh, some particular groups for uh, different reasons, different functions for what it has been created. This is more than in transformers. It could be, uh, for example, in geolocation, when you are using your cell phone and governments can eventually, um, autocratic governments can follow your steps and can use could be used, for example, for public health issues, which is a, a, a very reasonable thing, but also could be used just to, for, for um, surveillance for political reasons or many other things. Uh, other challenges, clinical trials, 
how are they going to be? How many IRBs are prepared to deal with those new experiments? Uh, another challenge is what it's known as prompt injection attack. And this could be serious. I mean, it, that could be a hack in which eventually the model can be uh, invaded by actors, perverse actors, that could eventually modify the code and create something could be very dangerous uh, eventually to, in order to create any damage. Uh, of course, lack of empathy and compassion, it's a big concern for those who practice medicine because it's supposed, not necessarily humans have a lot of empathy and compassion, but this is supposed to be one of the main values for those who are practicing medicine, it's supposed to be. Uh, deepening of historical health disparities is another issue because, again, it depends on how this model has been trained. And that could be related also with discrimination in predictive outcomes. Uh, we, we thought that those models can be used for, for doing predictions about the evolution of clinical, clinical situations. But also, we don't know because of the black boxes how the system is making their determination and whether that is, could be eventually some uh, particular case being discriminated in order for economic reasons or any other aspect that maybe we don't know yet. So I want to finish with some comments. This is from, um, from the WLIP 2021 World Health Organization Guidance on Ethics and Governance on Artificial Intelligence for Health. This is a project, uh, my unit, my institute, it's a collaborating center, WHO collaborating center, and we work also on, on those manuals, which are, as many other things from WHO, aspirational, very uh, well-intentioned, but not necessarily easy to, 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 um, to work in the, real, in the real world. In any case, I want just to mention some of the of the aspects that this uh, guidance on ethics and governance uh, propose in terms of artificial intelligence for health. And you see how difficult it's just to apply those principles, those guidance in the real world, protecting human autonomy. It's very difficult in, in order how, how much autonomy do we still have. Uh, of course, uh, we think that those models have to promote human human well-being, safety, and the public interest. It, it's easier to say that to be done. Ensuring transparency, explainability, and intelligibility, intelligibility which is not easy for the reasons I mentioned before. Uh, fostering responsibility and accountability, and ensuring inclusiveness and equity and promoting AI that is responsible and sustainable. Those are basically very good aims. The problem is how to translate those aims in, into the real world. Um, other challenges, when those systems have to be used, always in some particular case, the problem of digital divide, you know about that. It's how, how difficult it's sometimes, not only in, in the gap between developed and developing countries, but also even in different communities in the United States, how the data will be collected and how we use. And this is important, and I don't have an answer, informed consent to use. It's not informed consent, consent that we know in clinical trials, but how much should you know as a patient that part of your diagnosis or your treatment is being, or, or any intervention will be already performed by one of those models, even with human supervision. But should we ask permission for doing that or will be part of, of, the, of the standard practices? So as I mentioned, uh, as we speak, there is an executive order in the United States for safe, secure, and trustworthy artificial intelligence. And there will be a lot of, of conversation about very difficult in a, to create universal guidelines because there are many international actors, as we speak, working on artificial intelligence. And, and not all the actors share the same values that we think we share 
in this conversation have to do with geopolitics, autocratic regimes, uh, and, and many other things that has to make these models very, I don't want to use the word concerning because it's whether we are concerned or not, it, it's happening and it, it will not stop. But we are we are aware that there will be a lot of, of um, situations in which it will be needed and more conversations about those honest actors working globally on that. So all those models are becoming another component of the US healthcare system. It remains to be seen whether those models can positively influence the US population social determinants of health. Will they improve it? Uh, we know that the uh, infant mortality is getting higher these days for what we know. Will those models be enough just to improve those disparities or by the contrary, will deep those inequalities? We don't know yet. Uh, if indeed, we need all that kind of deliberation, bioethical deliberation, also regulations, but more than regulation, we need to avoid bias and perpetuating past injustice. It means that all those are going to use that have to be aware that other than how fabulous it is, because it's amazing, also there is a risk of perpetuating past injustice. And so probably getting a striking and harmonious balance between innovation, regulation, and ethical standards is pivotal for meaningful advance of, of healthcare and social justice. I am also uh, making the scene of being too overly optimistic, but this is what we have to say when, when you speak about that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Latikwa. Well, we really appreciate both you and Dr. McCall providing your insights into this, uh, what's new to us in public health. Um, I know that both of you all have uh, done quite a, a lot of work in, in uh, this field in both um, the medical field and public health. And this is a really important uh, issue. And I, I think very valuable for uh, both our students and community members to be aware of. Uh, there are a few questions that have already, uh, we've asked, answered a couple, uh, and we'd like to go ahead and invite the audience to continue to add questions to the Q&A. Um, function, but while they are adding questions, I'd like to, to pose a couple uh, of my own, and I'm sure that Dr. Cummings would like to as well. And so this uh, first question is directed to you, Dr. McCall. Um, I find that uh, the apps that you're using are, are, are really interesting, and it's, uh, it's uh, very similar to a project that's being done in Vallejo, and I'm wondering if there is uh, a plan for you to have kind of a uh, widespread kind of um, testing of, of these apps, because I, I do know that, you know, kind of regionally, there are different uh, needs uh, by region. And so the app as designed that you showed us may not be, at least for the mental health um, app, may not, it may need a few, a little tweak, tweaking in order for it to be universal. Um, and so I was wondering what the plan is for that. Good question. So um, just to clarify, you're asking about the app that's uh, being designed to support individuals who are returning home from incarceration? No, the mental health app that was for African Amer women who identify as African American. I have another question yeah. about um, <laughs> <laughs> the okay. uh, you know people who are returning to their communities. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we did have our focus groups in um, in Durham, North Carolina, so in the South. Um, and right now we're getting ready to um, have co-design workshops specifically to um, create the content, the, the culturally responsive mindfulness-based cognitive therapy components of the app. And with that, we will have some sessions that are like in person here in in New Haven and the surrounding areas, but then we also plan to have some sessions that are virtual so that we can, you know, kind of account for some regional differences too and see, um, you know, get those recommendations from uh, from those women that might live out West or um, might live, um, you know, in other parts of the country. Um, as far as the pilot, um, 
I do plan to uh, to slowly roll roll out the app, and so we probably would um, you know pilot here first um, on the East Coast, and then uh, definitely uh, uh, make sure that we include uh, individuals who live out west to um, for the pilot. So there is a plan for that, um, but right now I think that with the focus on the content um, and thinking how we can recruit um, a very um, like diverse groups. So even when we did this and uh, the focus groups, most of the women had at least a bachelor's degree. So we wanted to make sure that even as we're thinking about creating the content that we're not only looking at um, including, you know, women who are not, you know, on the East Coast, but also those who may not have um, a college degree as well to make sure that we're not missing some of the, the things that they might need um, that we can include in the app. Absolutely, and I, I loved your point about auntie because uh, I'm, I'm right there uh, when I listen to, to, to my apps. Um, so uh, I have one other question and then I'm gonna, I'm not gonna monopolize all the time, but I also have Dr. a question Wilson. about- I'm sorry to interrupt there. And there's someone who just had a follow-up comment, um, Denise Coleman, who wants to get this uh, focus group in Solano County. That's where uh, Vallejo is is centered. So just FYI. Keep Absolutely. We'll, we'll definitely be in touch and make sure that we can, uh, you know, uh, continue to collaborate with you. Uh, so the re-entry program, I, I just found that exciting. Um, because I feel like uh, our reentry populations throughout the United States are overlooked um, and deemed kind of a hard to reach population, you know, people that are joining or rejoining their communities. And I feel like this is uh, right on time. And so um, how are you going to make sure that people who could really use this have the technology Right, so that's my concern. So, I mean, this technology is right on time, but then how do you make sure that the technology that's necessary, so the the phone or the iPad or whatever it is, um, is made available to people as they re-enter? Yeah, so as we were talking to them, you know, they expressed that when they are released from, from prison, they're kind of given the things that they came in with and kind of dropped off on the corner and, you know, uh, we have here the New Haven Green, so they're kind of dropped off in that area um, unless they're assigned to like a halfway home or something. And um, there's not much support uh, with helping them to con get connected to resources. So the reason why we decided to focus on an app is because they told us, you know, it's pretty easy for them to get a phone. So they said we can get a, 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 an Obama phone pretty easily, right? So I think the biggest challenge will be getting the word out um, that this resource is available. And so they provided a lot of um, recommendations on how to get how to get the word out, right? Um, they said it would be even great to know before they are released that this app is available so that they can prepare to, to, to get it um, installed on their phone and that will help support their transition easier. Great work, it's very interesting. And we'll definitely be in, in touch uh, regarding that project as well, especially with our criminal justice and uh, public health uh, track. So let me uh, turn this over to uh, Dr. Cummings as I read through the questions that are coming in our Q&A. Yeah, and I'm actually gonna read one question from a colleague of Sergio's, uh, Professor Sullivan, who you know very well. Uh, yeah. She's asking, um, we have some research where we do informational interviews for qualitative research um, on sensitive subjects. And I know you both have worked together on some uh, mm -hmm. ethics, some ethics work together. Do you have any best practices about how participant discussions won't get out of the Zoom recording? So obviously you that's where you're doing a lot of your work and gathering data. Um, but in terms of how that, that information is saved to the cloud, which is where all of it is going these days. I we, we never quite understand what's happening in the cloud. We just know that that's where the information is going and we have to retrieve it. Yeah, oh, it's great to, to, to read, uh, to hear from Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Um, it, it, I have no answer for that because as you said, Gail, we don't know. We, we, ex we have some expectation of 
confidentiality in terms of how the data is being protected in the cloud. And we hope so because everything is in the cloud, electronic health records and a and, and lot of information that are very personal. Now, how that information is it's being protected, we trust. And not necessarily our trust is going to be rewarded by the facts, but we trust. Um, if, if those are sensible questions, probably the way to work on that before uploading into the into the cloud is just to make sure that they have an animation model in place, if that's possible. I mean, there are many different uh, ways to anonymize information. Eventually, uh, more most of the information, personal information, could be de-anonymized, but it would create more work. So you have to be careful about, for example, things that seems to be uh, totally minimal, like zip codes or or any other geographical reference. Now, the downside of that is, I assume, if you are working on research projects and qualitative research, you need some information as well that maybe have to be related to where those people live or where those people work or what the people do. So again, it's it's just to be being careful in how those models are being, those data, that data is being anonymized. And in the other hand, trying to preserve those data that makes those questionnaires used for research. So now in terms of the cloud, as you said, Gail, we don't know, we trust. Uh, everything that we do is going somewhere in the famous cloud. Uh, those systems are crawling everywhere. Whether they are taking from, I don't know. We will know when all those uh, lawsuits began to develop and we will see what is going on and where that information is being taken. Yeah, it, it is, uh, you know. Yeah, and, and uh, Sarah, Sarah is responding. Difficult to make the data anonymous when there is a, a video of participants in the interview. So, again, if you need the interviews, and that those interviews have to be uploaded into the cloud, we, again, suppose that there are some cautions, but we don't know whether it could be hacked. It could not be any way related to the information related to to the way that it's being managed by the by the by the uh, those who own those models. There are models to anonymize even those things in the way that what you call blockchains. I mean, there's a lot of system that being used in the web in which you can just make sure that those information is being private. It have to do with a lot of codes and, and things that people that are working in IT, I'm sure that they can advise about just to, how to minimize risk. Blockchains is one of those eventually. Yeah, I mean, it just makes you just really understand the need that uh, our institutional review boards are really going to have to do, you know, need a lot of additional training and uh, support yeah. to help help researchers kind of sort and navigate through these, uh, you know, how this is, you know, evolving over time. It's moving so quickly. Um, and I know- Well, that... this, is, this is one of the problems we have. Most of the IRBs, I would say almost many of those, are not well prepared for dealing with these things. And that's, it's not their fault. It's the, oh. the problem is, this is the pace of those that, if you think that in 2017, Google launched the first transformer. Now we are talking about models that mimic and 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 and, and, and the human language. I mean, the pace is very very fast. So, but yes, IRB members have have to be trained in in order to understand those problems. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, it it just gives us a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, uh, mm -hmm. as we kind of as we continue to learn and um you know one of the another question and this is actually for uh, dr McCall uh and for dr Litqua. uh mm -hmm. so just th thinking about the work that you do um dr McCall and then the, sort of the the challenges that that um Sergio has kind of put forth with regard to uh 
uh, prevention in term of, terms of biases, someone's asking, is it possible for AI to have enough awareness to recognize when the information that it's fed is, is bi actually biased? How, you know, and I know that's just kind of secondary to your work, but I know it is, 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 is you know, front and center in what you're thinking about as you are developing these apps. Yeah. So, um, I mean, as, <laughs> as Dr. L mentioned, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? And so when you're thinking about whether the data that you're using to actually train this model is biased, I think that having some accountability um, as far as like who is actually selecting the data, right? Um, who's a part of the process? So we recently actually published a, a paper on community-based natural language processing um, and kind of advocated for our, you know, wanting not only, you know, experts or professionals uh, to be involved in the process of, um, you know, thinking about creating these algorithms, but also including community members and patients to kind of um, be a part of this process so that they could kind of weigh in, you know, on like potential biases with the data. So I think that having some transparency and also making sure that it's not just, you know, prof you know professionals or um, developers that are, um, you know, a part of the process will help a lot. But as far as thinking that, you know, oh, AI is gonna recognize that it's bias. I, I don't see that. <laughs> I think it's on us as human beings to um, make sure that we do our due diligence in trying to um, think through like what data is um, being used um, and if it has, if there are some potential bias in that data. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, and 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 I'm also taking the question. I've I'm seeing a question formulated by Tiffany Barrett about yeah, which has to do of. about how that information is being biased. And again, this is one of the things that have to be already arranged when in in the way that those models work. They have some sort of oversight, human oversight, but there have to be some model validation and that model validation have to be reiterated over time and time and time just to see if there are any deviation of what the, the system are, have been doing. You cannot control how much the system, the, the, the data that it's feeding the, those models, it's, it's, it's already biased or not, unless that you see the outcome so far, what I know. You see whether, and, and for that you need the human intervention. There is no any other way to do that. Now, how labor intensive is that human intervention? I don't know, because you have to have people being curators, curators of of, of all the data, and, and that is also a big problem in that. So um, I, I wish somebody with some experience in that kind of uh, models and, and the way that those models are working could say because all what we read those who are who are not have any economic interest or working on that those are positive news so we have a lot of people who are very optimistic about how those models are going to be responsive to most of the needs in the medical field for example or many other things and we from the ethics standpoint, we don't want to be the negative world saying mm, it, it, it's not going to work. It, it's, it's working already. But there will be, I, I think that, and again, I don't want to be negative. I know that there are some people, what I say, it's just probably, you know, research ethics and ethics and bioethics in general, it's the fuel is a scandal. So there is a scandal and then you have I mean, you have Tuskegee, you have World War II, you have, and then there is a reaction trying to fix those problems. And it could be that eventually there will be, we will hear in the future some big problem related to that and there will be corrective actions. But meanwhile, it, there is a lot of enthusiasm. So I cannot say how that's going to be fixed. Thank you so much. I really appreciate both of you taking the time, especially uh, 
being on the East Coast and uh, we're kind of uh, going into your dinner time. So we appreciate the time that you've taken to be with us to really share your research, to share kind of your knowledge on how the intersections of technology and public health are so important for our public health students and clinicians who are listening and our community members to really be aware of and to be better informed uh, so that they can make good decisions about their health and also to advocate for members of our community. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna say good, good night and thank you and we appreciate your time. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Good night. Good night.